All right. Brock is in the green room. Brock, hang tight, buddy. We're going to do the intro and uh, bring you on here shortly. All right. I think you're ready. I'm ready. So we will go three, two, and one. Blast off. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. Sean, today we're going to be uh, discussing the a lot of things, but we're going to yeah. be talking about using borrowed authority mm -hmm. in your marketing, which is really interesting. We've got a guest coming on here shortly, Brock Swenson. He's going to be sharing a little bit about his background. He's worked with uh, some pretty big names in the uh, ClickFunnels uh, world with, um, who is it? Russell Brunson. Yeah. I think I, yeah, some guy, guy named Russell Brunson, right? And, th and this other guy named Tony, <laughs> is it Robin <laughs> Robins? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Never heard of that guy, but yeah. I know the Russell guy. <laughs> yeah. Good old RB. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, look forward to having him on shortly. And, uh, I think he I gotta, actually, he has a beverage, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I, <laughs> When I saw his name, you sent me the stuff. I was like, Brock Swinton. Is, like, is he a character in like a 50s detective novel or something? Because uh, like Brock Swinson, debonair. That sounds something, like something. it sounds like a character, right? That yeah, you would definitely. create a, a series based on. So. Yeah. So, I mean, people, you know, give me a time, hard time about my name. I mean, that that sounds like yeah. a made up name. Brock yeah. Swinson. Yeah, that's so, right. Like, he's either like a fifties detective or something like that, or an eighties jock. Yeah. Like, you know, high school football player or something like that. I don't know which, but, uh, but yeah. I like, yeah. I, yeah, I think the character, the detective, the Dick yeah. Tracy type type name. So yeah. we'll bring him on and see. Cool. His original name might be something totally different. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> He's a writer. So that's what writers do, right? They, yeah, they just make stuff up. That's, <laughs> oh, we weren't supposed to say that. <laughs> Not bad. All right. All right. With that said, should we just go ahead and bring him up? Since yeah, he's, he's, got, a he's got a beverage. Let's bring him on. We'll All right. First. So we welcome in studio Brock Swenson. How you doing, Brock? Hey, guys. How's it going? Thanks for your time today. Yeah. I got to give you a little, uh, if you got you know, fake applause, fake names, we're talking here. So all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's a COVID era, man. We just right, right. got to mock applause. <laughs> we're going to do some cardboard cutouts behind us, but, you know, just... <laughs> Didn't we really don't think that's a pseudonym. We, I think that's your real name. So it's a real, it's a real name. Real name. Awesome. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, before we get started, I know you got you mentioned beer. You could yeah. uh, brewing. I think I kind of got the feeling from just our your email that uh, you're you're a brew drinker, right? I am. Yeah. I got. I think I was a, a liquor guy early on, but <laughs> I, a little bit after that, I got really into the darker beers. I'm from North Carolina. We have a good brewery scene. Lived yeah. in Oregon for a while. They have a good scene there as well. Awesome. This is a, a Voodoo Ranger. It's a beer from Asheville. And I've also yeah. got uh, a, a backup beer. These are both IPAs. Uh, a Hopium from right here in Winston-Salem where I'm at. It's a place called Foothills. I think we're more, I don't know if they're everywhere. I think they're more local than that. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So which one are you having? You're having the, the Voodoo Ranger? The, yeah, the Voodoo Ranger, I thought would, would be Tell first. us a little bit about it. What's the uh, ABV, the... IBU, the CK, the CKK, the whatever. <laughs> All those acronyms. This yeah. is a seven percent alcohol, New Belgium Voodoo IPA from Asheville, okay. uh, and from a little local place nearby. That uh, I love. I love to go to places that just sell local beer, and in North Carolina, yeah. that's that's kind of a thing. So, a place like cool. two minutes up the road that just has a lot of good selection. Well, you would love our original craft beer club club. Yeah. Um, they do micro brews. You can throw up that little logo there, Jonathan, but they do micro brews from around the country. So this, I just got a new box today. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to be having one from the Double Mountain Brewery and Cidery, Cidery in Hood River, Oregon. So you, was that near your stomping ground or? I was in like uh, the Ash uh, Ashland area, so yeah, probably no idea like, how close those are, but uh, <laughs> it's right at the California line. Okay. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, yeah, Double Mountain Brewery, Hood River, Oregon. So I'm having a, I'm also having a pale ale, hmm. um, 
because it had the highest alcohol content of the four <laughs> that I got this week. So it's one of those weeks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called the Vaporizer, mm -hmm. and it's an American Pale Ale. Nice. Um, I'm a little worried because it has a giant picture of hops on it. But I know, I know. That's um, scary when you first see that. You know, it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, so it's like 55 it's IBUs, 6% ABV, and here's the copy on it. A golden hued pale ale that features a beautifully hoppy aroma and flavor. The double mountain vaporizer is an appetizingly dry, clean and pure tasting take on a hoppy pale ale. Yes. Challenger hops, Pilsner malt and a house yeast strain are the headliners in this brew resulting in an agile, alluringly herbal and supremely refreshing ale. That's a lot of big words for beer. Uh, the dry hopping pumps up the hoppy goodness and really makes this beer sing we're not big hops guys on this. We're more, you know, stouts and porters and yeah. uh, that that world. Um, but I figure summer's coming. I got to get used to it. Right. Might yep. as well. Might as well like, drain these and try them. I like a variety. My backup is actually called Hoppy. I mean, it's got a giant as well. So it's <laughs> wow. Quite, yeah, it's like, right that's, there. that's why it's second. That's the second that's, one. So. <laughs> that sounds like that would be the beer that was in the corporate uh, lounge for the movie uh, Avatar, right? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Because they what what was the uh, unobtainium was the mineral they were mining for so of course oh, yeah, the, beer, that's right. the beer would be like hopium <laughs> why not gotcha so we have to have like movies references on the that's show right, yeah. and things like that so Jonathan yeah. what do you have yeah. okay I've got a nar is it narwhal or do we agree did we figure out as narwhal or narwhal narwhal From narwhal okay. It's not the same Narwhal because the last one wasn't any good, right? <laughs> no, actually, it was pretty good. It was oh, okay. pretty good. I can't so remember. this is a uh, barrel-aged Narwhal from Sierra Nevada. It is, let's see, duh, 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 duh. Uh, what is this, 9%? 9% ABV? It says, deep in our barrel room, out of the light's reach, our legendary Narwhal Imperial Stout rest in bourbon barrels for nearly a year. After wow. aging, it emerges anew. Rich with notes of oat, vanilla, coconut, layered onto this stout's malt flavors of dark chocolate and espresso. I didn't know this was an imperial stout. Wow. Hmm. It is. Okay, cool. That's even better. Yeah, yeah it's like okay. nine, uh, let's see, nine. Oh, no, no, no. Eleven. Eleven. Oh, Man, my wow. goodness. Eleven point so nine. Good. So, yeah. <laughs> so, the question is, is it going to be like super sweet or is it going to be just going to be good? It's going to be dark. I know. Oh man, yeah. that thing is dark. 23 is he even got the, uh, I wish I knew this gravity stuff. Original gravity is 23.9 degrees. Finishing gravity is six degrees, whatever that, I mean. Yeah. What's the viscosity? I mean, it's, it's a dark beer. <laughs> <laughs> is that 10 W 30 or 20 W 50? I don't know. What's interesting is it's uh 55 IBUs, you know, for, uh, yeah, it seems pretty high for imperial yeah. stout, but you can see well, I that's dark. Yeah, mine is yeah. not. Yeah. So go later. Uh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, shall we cheers? We shall. Cheers. Cheers. There we go. <laughs> We've had a fake clinking over here. Rock. <laughs> Pull out. Fake no clinks. Stop. Fake everything. <laughs> nice. <laughs> fake content we just make this stuff up so yeah. you're in, you're in the right place uh we even yeah. get fake ratings um so yeah. what's right. you can go first with your your fake rating of on a scale of one to five pints brock what do you what do you give yours five being the best give the beer um i would say four four and a half it's pretty pretty good pretty solid all right we gotta narrow you down a little bit we gotta, we're gonna have to nail you down man <laughs> you pick one that's a I'll go that's four. pretty big range <laughs> To me, there's a big difference between four and four and a half. That's right. That's um, right. On a scale of five. But um, so four and a half. We got you in at four and a half on that one, right? We can go four. It's okay. Four. Okay. Go down. All right. I'll okay. round down. Okay. For the integrity four. of the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the integrity of the fake reviews, right? Yeah. Um, all right, Sean. What, what do you give yours? What do you give um, your. Yeah. So this is not overpowering. It's kind of like a. <laughs> Again, I think it's, it's you know, there's a subtle difference or there are not so subtle difference between like an India pale ale and an American pale ale. And like the American pale ales, I'm actually kind of okay with. Like, I don't love them, but they're not, they're not bad either. The Indian right. pale ale is just, to me, are just overpowering. <laughs> I just, mm -hmm. most of them I don't like. 
So this is American Pale Ale. Um, I'd give this a, um, let's see, I'll give it right down the middle, kind of, a, I'll give it a three, two. Three, two, okay. Yeah, it does finish nice and dry. There's no aftertaste, so I do like <laughs> that about it. Um, Brock, do you know the story? Sean, share the story about the IPA thing. He probably knows. Do you know the, do you know the story of why it's called India Pale Ale? No, I don't know. And why we try so to open. indoctrinate people. Everyone that comes on, do we yeah, try to I'm leave hoping. them with this so they'll never... Uh, Someone may have told me at 3 a.m. at some point, but I don't remember yeah. it. Okay, yeah. so, so the basic story that I've heard is, um, you know, India was a British colony, right? So they would ship beer from England down to India, which usually had to sail, you know, a ways. So by the time, it was about a three-month journey. So by the time the beer got to India, it was sour or bitter or whatever you want to call that flavor. But the Indians... Like the the country of India, not the American Indian Native Americans. Right. Yes, not Native Americans. <laughs> um, got used to the taste, so that's what they came to expect when they when they came back to you know Britain or wherever else. So they just acquired a taste for this this ale that had basically. I think back in the day, Jonathan, when we were in like college. We would have called it green beer, hmm. like if it just Probably. sits too long, you know. <laughs> Um, so that's, it's basically bad beer. That's my point. Like yeah. it's spoiled beer. <clears throat> Remember those, com I don't even know which commercial it was, but they used to do those bitter beer face. Um, yes. What was, do you know which, who that, I don't even know who was. Yeah. I can see the guy's face, yeah, but I can't, exactly. I can't remember which <laughs> beer it was. Effective advertising right there. <laughs> <laughs> There's your first lesson. For the show. <clears throat> right. Well, all uh, right, Brock. I'm excited. No, I got to get my about... rating. You keep oh, leaving man. me off, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm giving Good. mine a uh I'm giving mine a 4 a 495. Wow. wow. Give That's yourself tough. applause. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is really good. It's for the beer, I guess, right? Applause it's for the beer. It's for the beer. It's for the beer. So hold that can beer. up again so so those of us on the interwebs video this is webs. Really good. All so right. uh one of my buddies, I was talking to him yesterday. He's a big time listener of the show. Uh -huh. Mike Parsons out there. He's like, he really, I think he just listens to our beer reviews and then tunes out or probably yeah, turns us off. But off. Uh, <clears throat> you got to get this one, Mike. It's a Narwhal barrel aged. You said that's from Sierra Nevada, right? From Sierra Nevada. So it should be pretty nation. It should be nationwide, I would think. Yeah. Well, it's a four pack. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's one of those little fancy yeah. four packs I mean, so. you'd have to go to the, to the expensive store in town probably yep. but you know yep. so uh christopher stumpins says good morning fellas uh, ah good morning so obviously he's like not <laughs> did i miss something <laughs> here i don't know where he's at must be over <laughs> somewhere else um then we have a facebook user you yo. Y -O -O. yo yo i guess that's where that is yo yo um probably i don't know that yeah, if you David, ever want David Dutton, I'm thinking could be. Yeah, David would probably have not linked his. Like, so when you're in the, you have to allow uh, Streamyard access to your Facebook. Like, you have to link them so that it pulls your username through. Yep. But if you're into privacy and don't want to share that, you know, if you're into fake privacy and you're afraid that <laughs> they don't already know, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. All so right. Brock, I got to give our listeners a little intro to you. Yeah. Uh, just a little background. You're a freelance writer and author of the uh, of the book Ink by the Barrel. Is that pretty? Is that relatively new? Brand new, yeah. It's, Brand uh, new. Just, just came out uh, a couple awesome. weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Still so you diapers. host a uh, you ho you also host a podcast. I didn't know this. A YouTube series, Creative Principles, yeah. uh, which features audio interviews from screenwriters, actors, and directors. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, you spent, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you spent some time at ClickFunnels where you helped write ads for Tony Robbins and Russell Brunson. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're also going to, we're going to be discussing some of your background and also, like Sean and I teased at the beginning, some ways that you've used, I love this, borrowed authority in your marketing. Yeah. Um, so uh, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank Glad you. Glad to have I you appreciate on. appreciate it. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. So um, just a heads up, Rock, the Typically, the way this show goes, imagine three guys having a beer. Mm -hmm. That part's pretty easy. Um, and we're just sitting around talking shop. We'll That's just right. kind of go over wherever the conversation goes. Um, so, yeah, like, did you have a specific question you want to start with, Jonathan, or are we going to let 
Frog. No, why don't you share some? Hey, usually, just share a little background about yourself before we get into the topic. I, I'm curious about some of your. Uh, I want to talk about your book, but share if you would talk about some of your background in uh, with Click Funnels and doing some ads for those guys. Yeah, I'll kind of give you like a just a brief rundown. Um, yeah. When I like graduate, like my like last day of college, I went to school for like screenwriting and that type of thing. And I had a teacher who was more known for poetry mm -hmm. last day. So they haven't said this the whole time. Say something along the lines of, OK, so you get out there. You got about a one percent chance of being published. And if you do that a hundred times, you might be a professor. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. So that's yeah. a bad idea. Right. Um, so that led me to uh, something called El Elance at the time, which is now Upwork, a big mm -hmm. site. Um, so I started writing just whatever I could find articles. I've since like written everything, articles, ghost writing, uh, eBooks, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and I kind of found that like in my twenties, I basically just said yes to everything. Now I'm starting to say no to some things, kind of work things out. I took a little job writing about the walking dead, just writing about the TV show for this fan site. Oh, I ended cool. up like doing a Facebook live kind of like this. It was like, <clears throat> They had pretty good sponsors, that type of thing. I mean, some weeks it would be like 60,000 people would watch me. This little thing, like just like Chris Hardwick's show. Wow. I ended up like befriending some people on the show. Um, that like led to some other like relationships there. Um, and then that for some reason, it's just like they didn't quite have the marketing down. It never really made money. But the mm -hmm. owner of that uh, site referred me to ClickFunnels. So I did an interview with John Parks. John and I worked together. He's the VP of marketing at ClickFunnels. So we worked together there and for kind of a sister company, he's kind of a consultant at called Rose Club for Men. And I was kind of the full-time writer at Rose Club. I was in charge of the FOMO cure, the weekly roundup at ClickFunnels for a while. Um, I did that for maybe a year and a half or so, something like that. And while I was there, I did some of the ads and some marketing for the Tony Robbins, uh, Dean Graziasso and Russell campaign and this mastermind campaign. Which and, I, and I'm you know I'm kind of a spoken will at ClickFunnels. I mean it, it's like a hundred. It was probably two hundred people running a hundred million dollar company. Sure. Most of that's on Russell's shoulders, obviously. Mm -hmm. But all of that comes down to like that weekend. They I think they made like across different platforms. So Russell's and then Tony's and then Dean's. They made like nine million dollars in a day, basically. And all that's like I'm using a similar formula now to like work on my book and kind of do just follow like on a, a very minor scale of what that is. And then somewhere in, in between all that, too, I did some com uh, commercial work and film in L.A. I did some really bad TV shows. I, was, I worked on like the Guinness Book of Records. So I got to see people break records every single day, like five people try to break records every day. And that led me to a job at Creative Screenwriting. Um, and then from there, I started my own podcast because I realized we were not using the audio. And that was kind of maybe the first example of borrowed authority is like, I write here. Can I do this with the audio? They let me do it. So I branched out. In addition to screenwriters, we're missing opportunities with actors, directors, that kind of thing. Um, if I hadn't done that, we literally I talked to Ethan Hawke last week. My biggest interview, like by far, probably. Oh, that's awesome. Top three. Yeah. So all, all that's kind of like. But you can see like hints of that bar of authority, like kind of all through my background. Favorite Ethan Hawke movie is by far the one with um, Ethan Hawke in it. The one with Ethan Hawke in it. <laughs> Training Day. I was trying to remember yeah, Training yeah, Day. Yeah. That was like the coolest movie. Right. He's really good, really down to earth. And mm -hmm. he's kind of a novelist, too. So he, it's, it's funny. Like he's really into it. We talked about his new show on Showtime um, yeah. called The Good Lord Bird that he's in. And my, my podcast is called Creative Principles. So it's yeah. all kinds of stuff on there like that. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. I've got a question about the $9 million day. Because <laughs> you, you hear stuff like this in the internet marketing world, yeah. you know, thrown around all the time. And not just, right. to be fair, not just internet marketing. Anybody that does a launch, you yeah. know, of any kind. But tell us, like, how many people were involved and how many days, weeks were leading up to that one day? Because I think, right, you know, yeah, sometimes sure. there's a skewed perspective and it's like this one day launch, but it's actually yeah. it's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. Like I said, like I, I was in the scrum meetings every day. I would write ads when they would ask me to. So it might be I probably only saw a third of what was happening, too. Like yeah. I didn't even see everything. So I see what's at ClickFunnels. But you probably got one is like setting the relationship up to connect with Tony Robbins, which even at Russell's, you know, high status like that's almost impossible, but it did yeah. work out because of the way Russell networks and handles himself and that type of thing. But I would say 
from my perspective, you've got 200 people working on it for probably six months. I mean, not, not all of it. Russell's got multiple things going yeah. on every day, obviously. And I would say that's probably a third of it. There's Tony's team and Dean's team at the same time, if not more than that, because Russell's not hesitant to reach out to all the other influencers that he's worked with and everything else. Yeah. So I mean, you think, yeah. you think about that. I mean, all of a sudden the profit margin goes from like this fantasy $9 million, you know, now you've got, you know, let's say, you know, a third of those 200 people's man hours were on this project and the other two thirds were keeping everything running and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Six months. That's a lot of man hours yeah. towards a project like this. And like you said, you have two other teams that are doing something similar. Yeah. So, I mean, I think people need to understand, um, like, for a really successful campaign, there's a lot more that goes into it than just sitting down with a swipe file or a template yeah. and cranking out some copy. Like, yeah, yeah. it's not that, quite that, that easy. And that particular <laughs> campaign is kind of relevant to today because it wasn't a live, I mean, it wasn't like an in-person event like many of these mm -hmm. things are. It was actually like a virtual type thing, which was coincidentally, I, I guess it was, I guess it was like 2019 about when they were doing that. Yeah, but I to give that. another example, like um, Russell's worked with Grant Cardone some some example of like the attention to detail that he goes in so if he's doing an event in front of i want to i want to say it was like nine thousand people at grant cardone site, something like that so most people go they're like oh this is great people are going to see me it's this many people i'm just going to give a hell of a message and they're going to buy it yeah. russell will bring in i don't know 50 to 100 volunteers to go put something in every single person's seat so they have this thing to fill out right there he thinks about because he kind of got started with like public speaking before he went digital and that type of thing he really thinks about like every little last detail and that's what the team is working towards and it's so it's, even if you've got all the pieces right you still have to like go above and beyond like every step of the way yeah yeah because it's those little things i mean i guess it's you know it's probably like I would imagine like screenwriting, like it's the little things that add to the the overall experience yep. and the believability of yep. the campaign and everything else. Right. So yeah. what have been, you know, it seems like a lot of copywriters I know are into some type of art of some kind, right. Yep. Whether it's, you know, stand up, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, songwriting, playing an instrument, you know, writing fiction. And also, I mean, one of the, best copywriters Herschel Gordon Lewis. I mean, he made like gore horror films and stuff like just, yeah. you know, all kinds of stuff. What's the, what do you, is, do you see a crossover between those two or is like, just, it just kind of, I know you went to school for that, but yeah. What's the crossover there? Is it, yeah, it's well, writing, but yeah. what do you learn from each and take to the other? I would say like the, the show, the podcast I do, I'm obsessed with like, like I literally say like the intersection of creativity and like productivity, but also like marketing. Right. So like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm most interested in like, how do you market something that you're passionate about, but you're also finding this like niche in the audience and that type of thing. So there's definitely just like that. I mean, that's the end challenge. That's the big complication. Like if, if I want to talk about like my book, for example, um, I'm trying to reach people that know they want to write, but they never really tried to do it. So my book is all about like being prolific. The whole point is like getting your mindset right for whatever it is. So I think like marketers and entrepreneurs could read it because I'm coming at it from an entrepreneurial perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true for like, I'm, I'm constantly asking producers a, a question similar to you asked me, because if you're producing a movie, you're selling creativity. You're talking about someone's vision you really have to have this like personal connection that I think most people ignore because everybody wants to say like, well, Thor is awesome. I'm going to write another movie like Thor or whatever it is. But like, even if you're writing an alien movie, what's your personal relationship to that? And that's one of the best movies are a lot of them are slow burn, but there's something there. There's some other character piece. Otherwise you might as well be doing the, you know, lifetime, you know, movie of the week type things where it doesn't really matter. I mean, not to, you know, but it's just a formula type thing. And yeah. those movies are what, are what they do. But I think you're, you need to know the rules of the genre, that type of thing. You want to like, you don't want to be generic, but you want to follow the rules and you want to make it your own. And I think it's like, the, matching all that up is is the impossibility of like filmmaking and why there are a lot of movies that get made but there's way more that don't get made you probably see three percent or something every year that come out even less right now mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. it's it's a it's a sad time for movies for sure because yeah. <laughs> we have not seen any decent movies come out right you know the good ones are keep getting pushed back uh yeah. or the ones that we think will yeah. be good 
It's also the giant split right now of like, here's 60 million, here's 2 million, everything else goes to TV. And the only person making the, you know, what used to be like Jerry Bruckheimer films is Christopher Nolan. He's literally the only one, right? There's no one else that's making a movie that's not IP, right? Like I'm not yeah. talking about Batman. I'm talking about like Inception yeah. or Tenet or some of those. He's, he's, he's it. Maybe Tarantino, you know, some of those that are kind of carryover from the nineties. Yeah. So I don't know. Like I, I, I miss that. Like it's someone who like still kind of strives to write movies and that type of thing. I'd like to mm -hmm. see more of those even if they weren't great movies, like movies like Con Air and like stuff from the 90s that were like memorable, right? They're like yeah. a new movie. You've never seen it before. Con Air is a great movie, man. Right. <laughs> it's like a, all that's like Nicolas Cage is one of his best. <laughs> it's one of those mixed ones. You got you get that lets you judge other people what they think of <laughs> that movie. Put the yeah. bunny down. I mean, that right. you can't get a better as, line than that. So <laughs> yeah. So what is your favorite Nick Cage movie? Jonathan, I'll ask you first. And then Brock, I'll come back to you. Ooh, um, uh, Family Man. Oh, all time favorite. Yeah. Okay. Brock, what's yours? Uh, all the way back to Raisin, Arizona, I think is probably the, <laughs> the top. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, you asked it. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I was just, I'm trying to think of, there's so many of them. Um, He's waiting I, if he wants to say face off or not. I know you're yeah. thinking. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, I would probably. I like, I mean, I liked Gone in 50, 60 Seconds. I thought that was. Oh, yeah. That's but I just, a great one, yeah. It was like, that was like um, Fast and Furious before Fast and Furious yeah. came around, you know? It's just like yep. fun movies, yeah. Plus yeah. a heist movie. Heist movies are always good, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that was that would probably be my favorite. And I feel he, that was one of the few he, he didn't like overact in a lot. Yeah. Like, it just felt like he kind of was in a groove there. It's just, but, you know, he's uh, a, you he's know most people place, don't think yeah. about the Marvel movie he was in, which is... Um, Oh, the ghost, ghost rider, ghost rider. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I didn't even, I mean, I, I don't even think of that as a Marvel movie because I'm not yeah. that deep into, into the, into that the world Marvel universe. He, he I'm does, more of a surface Marvel fan. <laughs> he, he does so many movies. There was a point where I was like, I was doing interviews and I was like, okay, I just interviewed like three Nick Cage directors in a row. There's way too many <laughs> Nicholas Cage movies. Like stop yeah. making so many movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think the most disturbing was probably Weatherman. I, I like that one a yeah. lot. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, kind of a, it was a little too a honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was the problem. Yep. So I've weird, right. the weird thing is if he made like one sixth of as many movies, he might be Daniel day Lewis, you know, if he just yeah. like, didn't do all yeah. the other, you know, which is crazy is he's, he's made all those movies, but he's still like financially, I think he's, he's still broke. Yeah. You know, that's uh, yeah. he likes to spend money. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, wow it's crazy all right so so what is there anything you've learned from like um screenwriting that you can apply to advertising as far as like the pro not as far as like the format or the not the format but the the structure that's the word i was looking for mm. Mm. i would say yes and no so like my instinct is that if you're ever too formulaic, you're writing something that's kind of shitty, <laughs> you know? So like the same thing. So I, I'll do like, it's funny cause I almost do like more work because I worked at ClickFunnels than I did at ClickFunnels. Like I worked here and I get all these landing pages, jobs and these mm -hmm. big sequences or whatever. Yep. And so I had a job interview like two days ago with this guy and he told me like towards the end of the interview, he said, you know, I really like your approach. Cause I was talking to him about his book and his vision and his, his what he wants to do and how I can like enhance that. Mm -hmm. He said, everyone else he talked to that day said, here's my promise of my formulaic approach to you. And that's great for scalability. And sure. I, mean, I guess, you know, long-term thinking or whatever, but you really need to have some, like I said, like something like personal there, it's gotta matter. You know, if yeah, you're too you personal, don't... it's hard to get those movies made, but they're the best ones, you know? Right. Yeah. If you're the client, you don't want to just be another, uh, formula, you know, for, right. yeah. I mean, you kind of want to fill that, uh, tailored approach, but, uh, so are you a big, um, I know you're, you're into, obviously you're into, uh, movies. What about in terms of novels, fiction writing? Are you big on, uh, Stephen King? Do you love a lot of his stuff? I've got into Stephen King kind of later. So I've actually read more of his newer stuff. Like he wrote a book called Elevation. I read The Outsider mm -hmm. before they made that a series. Oh, but I ironically story. haven't read his old older stuff, but yeah, mm -hmm. I've kind of, you almost have to, because like there's so many Stephen King IP shows and movies just to keep yeah. up with it. So I interviewed the guy that wrote Castle Rock. And if you don't know most of his catalog, you won't even understand what's going on with Castle Rock, which is 
based on all of his stories, basically. Yeah. yeah. Have but you I read his? Yeah. Have you read his on writing? His like book about writing? Yeah, I, I um. So I've so in addition to like my interviews, a lot of my research is like books like that. So like Stephen mm -hmm. King and John McPhee and Chuck Palahniuk's got a great book. The guy that wrote Fight Club wrote a great book on writing, which is kind of it kind of surprised me how like good it is. But yeah, I, I love stuff like that when they really get into the nitty gritty of it and that kind of thing. And then, was he talking about fiction or was he just talking about writing in general? The last I would one. Say, would yeah, say I would say like Chuck Palahniuk. Chuck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's the Fight Club writer. His is like his is more fiction, but it's he's got such a unique approach. Like he breaks down how he transitions between thoughts, how he creates. A lot of his novels have like weird threads in them. Like um, like this one is supposed to be like an FBI document where things are redacted, or you know, like mm -hmm. that's one of the big stories. And then obviously Fight Club is the you know mixed metaphors and. Um, you don't know who the protagonist and, and I am Jack's this and that. And I mean, you know, I, as much as I try to go away from fight club, like I'm, I mean, my friends are, I can't stop referencing it. Like even today, sure. I'm like, well, it's back to fight club again. We can't, you know, it's, it's hard <laughs> to avoid it. So yeah, it's a classic. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you know, those, those kind of movies, like you said, just stand out and they're not, and like you said, they're not making as many anymore because they're, it's a bigger risk, right? I mean, yeah. same thing is true in copy, right? You've got some formulas that you know will get base hits for the mm -hmm. most right. part. But you'll never get a breakthrough yeah. using yeah. those formulas, you know, and that's the problem I have with templates. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think they're really good for a lot of people, especially business business owners who aren't full time copywriters. They need to get something out into the world. I think templates are great. And I know you do. Yeah. You've done some work with Jim Edwards and, mm -hmm. you know, some of that stuff that they do over there. Um, and I think those are useful, but I don't think you'll ever get breakthroughs from that kind of thing. Right. It's also just like mind nubbing. Like if you're a copywriter, listen, you think that's your dream job. I, I had like three job interviews in the last three or four months that are like, hey, we want to hire you and you're just going to churn out copy. Yeah. We're going to show you, you know, here's the formula. And I was like, I do one sample. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I can't like, yeah. I don't care about yeah. this. I'd rather take somebody for six months across the finish line or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. And really I'm get the same to, way. Like, what is the heart of this thing? Because it's yeah. so much trial and error. You can't like you're giving somebody crap if you're churning out this like formulaic approach, or at mm -hmm. least most people are getting crap, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to have just a really strong already offer and everything built in yeah. to make that, those kind of formulas work. Right. Um, I mean, you know, I've taken some B2B products and used like classic swipes in a B2B way. And we've had some really good success because it's, yeah. it's so new. And you know, the bars to me is much lower over in B2B than yeah. B2C. But, um, yeah, I totally get you on, on that. Um, you could get I very boring. You're, you're, very you know, quick. your ads, you know, copy, borrow, whatever, but like your real pay, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it can be really boring and mind numbing. So I would make it, make it your own constantly change it to a lot of people. I'm like, I'll give you a version, but you got to change this thing every little bit. Like it's got to get better. You got to pack in those testimonials, whatever it is, it's got to be kind of a morphing type thing. And Russell will have this ad performs the best. And three months later, that one's dead, but he brings it back nine months later, like whatever it is. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah like cycling them works. Yeah. There's gotta be a multitude. Yeah. I mean, when I worked at Agora, we had, you know, just in the division I was in, I was at Stansbury back, you know, 2010, we had 12 copywriters, mm -hmm. you know, writing on writing for probably four front end publications and probably four or five back end publications. Right. Um, and we just constantly needed new stuff. Cause like you said, like one would fatigue, you got to put that on the shelf and you bring another yeah. one out, same subscription, but different lead, different offer, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but then you could bring the other one back around, like you said, nine yeah. months and like all of a sudden it's got legs again, you know, cause right. the right. audience just gets tired, of, just get tired of seeing it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got you, you know, I almost like avoid, I mean, you can't really now, but I almost, or at least for a while tried to avoid like Facebook only ads because it's, you got to write for Disney world to write, to write for Facebook. It's got to be happy. You're cause you go from like, here's pain points. Here's like towards pleasure. It's all towards pleasure. It's all happy. It's all good. It was like, well, these people have a problem and I can't really address that problem. So you have to yes. figure out what that is. And, you know, it constantly, it was, it was interesting because I was kind of there when like ClickFunnels got big enough to where we had to talk about the FCC and different things like that. We can't mm -hmm. just say what we want to. And, you know, we can't even say stuff that's true. I mean, I, you know, obviously we, we have to yeah. be really careful, like how we're telling these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point about Facebook. I, 
I'm working with an agency now and that, you know, we have to do it. Facebook ads for our clients and yeah. like everything you learn about copy kind of has to go, not everything. <laughs> a lot of it has yeah. to go out the window. Yeah. Um, but I found like third person, you can get away with a lot more stuff. Um, if yeah. you write it in the third person, so you have to get rid of the youth, you know, where copy has to yeah. have the word you in it. And then first person stories work, you know, pretty well. Yeah. So that's how we you found it, yeah. The way Everything to get really it. work for you, just kind of get <laughs> move that yeah. side, and then. Yeah. So literally, I will have either myself or some of my writers uh, write out how they would normally write it, and then we just mm. take the the second person version and transition it to a third person. So instead of you, was, yeah. it, it kind of neuters it a little bit, but it's it's still better than you know if you don't if you yeah. aren't using any copy principles. That's kind of another like screenwriting thing, possibly. So I had a call with a friend of mine. He and I are this is the first time I've like tried writing a script with a with a, like a co-writer, that kind of thing. So we went back and forth and we're just like, let's always overwrite and cut back because that's where it's at. Like that's where the mm -hmm. sweet stuff is. It's in the rewriting and that type of thing. And like so the, so the book I wrote is kind of like it's in three parts. And it's like the whole point is to like um, defend your time, find your voice and then develop your process. And then even at the end of that, I'm still saying like, but your process is going to change. Like whatever you think is perfect is not quite perfect. It's not quite there. Sure. And if it is, you're just going to get bored to death with it. So you want to keep be, you know, keep working that kind of thing and, and focus on the practice, not the results, which is a little bit different than copywriting, uh, obviously. But right. You want to obviously you just have to have both of those that I think to be successful and to be like happy about it. Mm -hmm. So in your in your book title, I think you said the subtitle is prolific. The word prolific was in there, right? Yeah. Secrets from <laughs> prolific writers. Is okay. kind of, yeah. Yeah. So what do you consider prolif prolific writing? And is it different for screenwriting and copywriting? Is it a number? Uh, is it like how does that how do you define <laughs> prolific? It could, it could be whatever it is to you, like individually, but I would say like Stephen King writes every day. Christmas doesn't matter. Holiday, yeah. traveling, doesn't care. He writes every day. Um, some people write when, when inspiration moves them and they write this, you know, the, especially screenwriters. But, you know, I've, I've talked to many screenwriters, like real screenwriters who will say, you know, if it takes you two years to write a script, you're not a screenwriter. You know, so it's not really like. I interviewed a guy that I'm going to publish a, a podcast. Today. Uh, Daniel Wilcox is a, a UK writer and he's written 40 books in four years. And he feels like that's not quite enough. Like he's like, most people write a book every month. He's talking about like fiction horror specifically. But yeah. so it's like, you shouldn't compare yourself unless it's making you better. But I'll say whatever it is to you. I, so I have like a, a list of daily habits and one of mine is just to write something mean, meaningful like, so I talk about in the book is like the ritual is to write, but it, I don't put a restriction on the words because that breaks the habit. So I might just like, as long as I sit at my desk and write something, if it's a sentence, that's still something. And normally you write a lot more than that, but the ritual mm -hmm. is to do this and that kind of gets the process going. So you agree with the war of art that it's that breaking that first resistance, like just yeah. sitting down and starting to write is, is the battle. It's not, yeah. do you write 500 or 1500 or an hour or two <laughs> hours or whichever method it's more starting. I think, I mean, for me, it is like, once I get started, I'm into yeah. it. It's, I can go as long as I don't let myself get distracted by, you know, slag or something else. Right. I have to yeah. be in writing time. And you can kind of tell like, like talking to people. So like, I just started re like working out really regularly, like once or twice a day, all the time, like really trying to go at it. But I'll hear like a family friend is saying, I want to start walking every day, which is kind of a small thing anyway. It's like, I want to mm -hmm. start walking, but it's raining, it's cold, it's, it's whatever, right? Yeah. So unless you're like, unless you're, you know, planning a day or two ahead to cancel all that out, you're not really doing anything. If you're sure. starting Monday, if you're starting January 1st, you're full of shit. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, like yeah. just you start. To some degree, it's easier to start something really simple as soon as you can. And I feel like it took me 10 years to get that, you know, because I really think you just ignore most of the best advice you hear in your life anyway. It's yep. all pretty easy. All the cliches are true. <laughs> and people just kind of ignore it, you know. Yeah. You read well, a story, you know, you read like biographies of guys like Isaac Asimov. The guy, I mean, there's like, right. yeah. I mean, that that kind of discourages people. I'm sure a yeah, lot of people right, that yeah. want to get into writing, they're like, right. There's no way I can write like that. I mean, yeah. Or just like you read, uh, I, I listened to Elon Musk's biography. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
That dude works like 26 hours a day, you know, <laughs> right. he, use, he uses a time machine to sleep or something. I don't know what he does, <laughs> but he hasn't launched yet. No, um, he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. I don't think he does sleep. I think it's two hours a day or something like that. And people are like, oh, that's how I got to be. Well, that's not, you're not no. him. He you actually know? said in an interview, he said, you don't want to live my life. Trust yeah. me. That's yeah. like, he said, I would not wish that on anyone else because you know, of all the uh, ideas, he's just bombarded with ideas, so it's hard for him to sleep. So he's, yeah. you know, I could see that. I could definitely see, <clears throat> especially as you have success, like your ideas have more and more mm -hmm. weight for yourself. I would think. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I'm on. I'm on yeah, number yes. two as well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was trying to pace myself a little bit. Jonathan put both of his in one can, eleven <laughs> percent. So, um. So, do so I'm you, curious on your book, like break it down for us because you kind of touched on it. What is it? Um, break out, break down the, uh, you know, kind of who you're targeting and, you know, you know, why you wrote the book in the first place. Yeah. And, and what, what people can get out of it. I would say like the biggest thing, if there's a, you know, avatar is like we would kind of say in marketing is like, it's probably me 10 years ago. I mean, that's who needed this book. So sure. And if you, I sent it to some friends and I don't really have that many friends who I would say really want to be writers. They brought it up enough that I would say like, okay, they, you know, they kind of want to do it. But like, if I can talk you out of being a writer, you shouldn't be a writer. I would say that's like number one. Yeah. But if you like pick this book up and you think I've always wanted to do this, I just maybe want to get better at it. You've kind of, you've written more along the lines of like, I need the inspiration to do this. Mm -hmm. And I write a lot of bit of, about that and like what the muse is and all that kind of crap. That's not really real. Chapter three, I actually can't remember if I changed or not. The original, the original title for chapter three was writer's block is bullshit. Cause I really don't believe in it. I don't really think, you know, like if you're a doctor, you have to work every day. There's no block there. What are you talking about? Are you sitting at your desk every day? It doesn't have to be good. You know, I think there might be something missing in the last 15 years is because we went to computers from typewriters. There's not balls of paper on the floor, you know? So even if you sucked, you were there, you were in the sure. game, you know? Yeah. So some of it is kind of like that mentality. It's like, if you want to get into that mentality, that's where you're going to do better. And there's like, there's like psychological studies of like, I think it was a photography class. They said, all right, this half of the room is going to take one picture and get graded on it. This half is going to take 50 and get graded on them. And the best overall pictures were in the quantity number, not the quality, right? So like of those who took more and tried more things and did more things, I mean, that's where you're going to hit it at. That's why right. Seth, Seth Godin publishes a blog every single day in addition to everything else he does. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just a numbers game. I mean, as soon sure. as you can realize that you can step away from it, you can like let go of the attachment, you know, you can, like Brian Copeland will say, make it the best thing you can. But once it leaves your hands, you know, kind of the hell with it, like mm -hmm. whatever they do with it is, is their own thing, you know? Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to do to like almost like love something and then just like, all right, next, you yeah. know, just like, it doesn't matter. Well, you know, and I heard somebody say, so I got a couple of different things in my head. One, I've, I read a quote recently where somebody was talking about, you know, writer's block and they're like yeah it's not a real thing like truck truckers don't get truckers block you know they don't right, right. they don't wake it's up true. in their cab yeah. and be like <clears throat> yeah right. i can't call you know call into dispatch and be like hey i can't drive today i've got truckers block and they're like no you want to get paid you're going to sit at the, right. in the wheel and you're going to drive for eight hours today yeah. you know that's what you do you're a trucker yeah. um and as writers you know it's oh. like if you're not writing you're not you're not a writer mm. Yeah. And I think it was our, our guest last week, Bill, I think we asked him something about like tips for being a writer. And he's like, well, most, you know, or something like, he basically said, I don't really like writing. I like being a, having written, I like I've having written. written. Yeah. Having you know? finished. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said, but I hate writing for the most part. <laughs> like it's hard work. It's, yeah. you know, I think most writers do. You know, yeah, I think people it's honest with yeah. themselves. Yeah. yeah people yeah. say they love it. They're probably not a writer. They're probably, they're probably <laughs> not really actually a not, writer. not for a living anyway. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like right. it was, it's super fun. If you want to just every once in a while jot down, a, you know, a poem and, and go like yeah. one, one round with it and not, not tweak it or. I think they like the idea of being a writer. Like, the, yeah. you know, the way it's romanticized and portrayed. Yeah. You know, yeah, sitting that, with a notebook and a and a fountain pen or something like that instead of yeah. you know cranking out like 
you know, reams not even of, that. I think I think it's like the book signings, the IP deals, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, all that crap that yeah. like probably won't happen anyway. I mean, it's you know, sure. it's just it is what it is. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, it's like people well, you, who who you tell one joke and it lands in a group of friends. They're <laughs> oh, like, I man. can do stand up comedy. <laughs> yeah. And then you try to sit down and write a thirty minute special, yeah. you yeah. know, and and see how yeah. much work it is to write thirty minutes. Right. You on the I'll stage say, yeah. forever. Yeah. You know, I love I love listening to con- like Jerry Seinfeld's comedians in cars. I love when they talk oh, about that's that fantastic. stuff. Yeah. I've interviewed yeah. um, Rami Youssef, who writes a show called Rami on Hulu. He's a comedian. Mm-hmm. So he had like a show on Hulu, and he had a special on HBO at the same time. And we kind of talked at the beginning of the pandemic, and he was just giving like some really good advice about you know, people are dying to get on stage and this and that. We also talked about like so many comedians have a better website than they have jokes. You know, it's like you're focusing <laughs> on the admin, right? The yeah, admin right. doesn't matter. You know, your at your website's great. You know, that's the same yeah. thing as like, I worked with a, a startup that seemed really great. And we like, long story short, we hired about 50 great people and then they burned through $250,000 in about six months. And there was no product at the end of that. It didn't really matter what our copy was because they weren't quite there and they were setting it up kind of like a Kickstarter and maybe there was a chance to this working, but it was just like, it was all very happy till the end. Then it was like, what is going on? Cause we had just kind of this leader who wasn't quite there. And it was, right. I made a lot of good, like everyone, but this one person I'm, I'm still kind of friends with, you know, it was, it was a great team, but there's just like, you need that last bit. You need that Elon Musk type guy. You know, you need that thing for something like sure. that. Anyway, you need Russell Brunson or whoever it is. Yeah. To push yeah. it, push it over and the yeah. band that it actually gets finished. Yeah. Or that, just to say like, like, what are we doing wrong here? What, yeah. what assumptions do we have that are totally off? You know, mm-hmm. so some of that stuff, you kind of need this. Um, Adam Grant's got a new book out called think again. And that's kind of what's it about. What's mm-hmm. it about is like that, like, back and forth and like having someone there to check you on your shit to a degree, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about, um, I've really been enjoying lately and I've been writing for a while. Um, but I have just started reading in the last three months, uh, bird by bird. Yeah. Um, and find it pretty fascinating, like just yeah. really good writing. Like mm-hmm. what I think of is just like really not obviously nothing to do with copy or sales. Yeah. Um, but I think there's some lessons there for sure. Um, yeah. That's, but, that's a reference in the book too. I can like a quick summary is that I think it's like the, is it the writer's little brother has got to do a project about, I don't know, 50 birds. Mm-hmm. And he said, how am I going to do this? And the parent says, well, just do it bird by bird. Yep. <laughs> and the same thing is like, that's where you start. It's like, if you're, if you're wondering where you're like the kind of the point of this book is like, if you want to write movies, if you want to write a blog or whatever, it's still like that first thing. It's that first scene, it's that first blog post, it's that first job you get, yep. whatever. And you really have to be like precious about it, but move on to the next one and just know that it's going to take a long time and find a way to approach it differently. I think that was a big thing that like the self-reflection of the quarantine kind of taught me. It's like your approach is everything to this stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she, and she talks over and over about how difficult it is and how, uh, you know, just, you don't know what's going to come out. You just kind of have to start going and see kind of where it goes. And I think, I mean, a lot of people think that's just fiction. I think the same is true for copy. I was actually editing some copy today and the writer turned in, uh, one of my copywriters turned in some stuff and had one headline. I was like, this just isn't right. So I just, you know, I just, I start doing the suggestions on Google docs and, I just start writing another headline and then I'm like, no, it's not quite. I write another one, write another yeah. one, write another one, write another yeah. one. And then finally, like the fifth one, sixth one, it finally hit. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's, and it was nothing like the original or even the first yeah. one I started with. It just, it just kind of evolves yeah. and yeah. it comes from wherever it comes from. Hmm. Um, but I think a lot of copywriters, especially or people writing ads, they're trying to get the perfect headline. The first, you know, with yeah. one or two tries, and man, the, the greatest copywriters will tell you is like, you may have to write out 50 or a hundred mm-hmm. by hand or, yeah. you know, type out 50 or a hundred to, to get the one you want. And it may be one word difference. I don't yeah. know about you, Brock, but like when I do that, um, I'll, I tend to write in like bunches of three to five mm-hmm. and then like, they'll be about the same. Yeah. And yeah. all of a sudden a new idea will just come from wherever, Yeah, you know? 
because the synapses start connecting and all this stuff starts happening. It was like, oh, okay, we, we're not just kind of writing, we're actually writing because I've stuck with the keyboard long enough. The brain's like, oh, okay, I guess we're doing this. We're not going back to Facebook anytime soon, so I guess I'll, yeah. I'll start throwing out some ideas. And I think it takes a little while to break that inertia, you know, a couple yeah. minutes at least. Um, I don't think it takes like an hour. I just think it takes, yeah. like, you know, 60 seconds to probably, you know, five minutes where you're just going to sit at the yeah. computer and know that's what I'm doing right now is I'm just writing. Yeah. And, the, and the brain just says, okay, pull up writing resources and stuff starts yeah. coming out of your fingers. It's, I don't know if that's true yeah. for you. Yeah. Is that that's part of the process you know, type. Yeah, for sure. That's, there's the, uh, the Mark Twain quote is something like the right word is the difference <laughs> between the lightning and the lightning bug. You know, that yep. one word difference is like a huge difference. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the things you like, you don't see them doing on Mad Men. When he's sitting on the couch, he's still writing. Yeah, Same thing sure. like Lauren Michael says about the SNL writers. Like, I don't know what they're doing, but they come out with a show at the end of every week, you know, whatever <laughs> yeah. it is, you know? So I'll tell you like one of my favorite line from my book, like wasn't something I thought of doing something else. I was sitting there like getting to it, you know, like chiseling it down, that type of thing. And so there was this story and I'll, I'll leave out the politics, but it was two politicians talking. And the story is about, um, it's it's lion hunting. It's a lion is out there hunting. Have you ever heard the story about the antelope and the mouse? No, uh, I've heard the lion and the gazelle, but, but tell, tell uh, it. Maybe we will. Yeah, yeah. But I'm so sure some of our listeners haven't. So <laughs> yeah. tell it like we tell it like we haven't. Sure. So the idea of the story is that like a lion can spend the whole day hunting mice. He spends the same amount of energy hunting field mice all day, but he's literally like burning more calories than he's taking in. So a lion has to go out and hunt gazelle or antelope, whatever it is. And the whole metaphor and the point of that is to like, look for those bigger things. Mm -hmm. I think when you like get that clarity in your mind, you can be like, like I, I was applying to some other jobs and I got them back and I got a job offer. And I was like, I don't want this. I knew it as soon as it came in, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's cause I was like, I need to really think about what I'm doing. I need to think more about long-term. You look at Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they're not thinking about this year. They're not thinking about a couple of years, you know? But like working on that, working on that section, I kind of had that quote and I found this line that I wrote, which was hunt that which sustains you. And that's my favorite line of the whole book. And I wouldn't have got it without like tinkering it and all this kind of stuff to like figure out what that means to me. You know, then it's like that's something the equivalent of like somebody might post on Instagram, but it takes a long time to get down to that thing and like figure out what it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And those and. And I think if you are a writer, it's those kind of moments. It's kind of like if you're a golfer, the good shot, that perfect drive, yeah. that, you yeah. know, 30 foot putt, like, yeah. like those kind of things. It's the thing that keeps you coming back yeah. is when you do get that turn of phrase, that's not only like clever and cause you know, sometimes clever doesn't work in writing, even though it's yeah. clever, right. it's not just something you like, but it's something that's just legitimately good. You know, yeah, sure. And I think as a writer, that's what keeps it's what keeps me coming back when I do get like that subject line for an email that's just like nails it. Right. And it's just like and I, and I can segue or, or the perfect yeah. segue or the perfect little turn of phrase halfway through the email that, hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what I personally like live for. And and I don't think you can like go in figuring out what that's going to be or where it's going to be. I, I do think it's a lot like fiction where mm -hmm. it kind of comes out in the process of writing. Mm -hmm. You agree or disagree? Just, yeah, I agree. I was noticing you said the word clever too. So we're back to fight club. How's that working out for you being clever? What is the first thing he says to him? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tell, yeah. I tell writers that all the time. It's like <laughs> clear beats clever every day of the week. Like, sure. Oh, so hard. Yeah. I've got, you know, I work with people that they've got a, it is a clever name for their company or whatever it is. I'm like, nobody knows what this is. You're better off with like something, you know, farm or what, you know, whatever, like what the second mm -hmm. word is what you are. The first Ace, word yeah. can be a little bit, you know, Ace hardware, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Home Depot. Yeah. Like we kind of, right. we kind of get it. We kind of know what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Ace I mean, is your creative part. You can run with that one, but yeah, let's get the same part. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's a good point. Like, and well, I think that comes from wanting to be original. Sure. Yeah. But that's in your, that's in your ads. Your ads can be crazy or what, you know, so yeah. I worked for, uh, uh, with John Parks at Rose club for men. I, what I is that by the way? That's a name and we don't so, know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Rose club for men. The, they never quite did exactly what they wanted to do, but it was James Frill and John Parks. A few of the people that kind of came from click funnels 
And the idea was that like guys all be the guy who always remembers, right? So you put your mom's birthday, your, okay. your anniversary, your wife's birthday. We send you a reminder you press a button. We send her roses. You don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff like that. We had a pretty good campaign. We did a lot of, and we're shifting like straight from Columbia and all this kind of stuff. But so the campaign I, I worked on was like, I'd find like unusual pictures of like attractive women on, on the website Unsplash. It'd be like a girl in a bathing suit with a Darth Vader vas- mask on, on a skateboard. And it would say like, some girls are hard to shop for it. Yours isn't. Send her roses. Like really simple stuff like that, you know. I think you can be really creative with that and just see if it works. But your name and these other things like Rose Club for Men is like, that's what it is. We're not trying to be something else, you know. There was another company that was doing the same thing. I cannot remember that I interviewed a couple times with to do some projects for. I can't remember that. So is that James P. Friel that was part of that? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I did not know he did that. I I mean, I knew he he does the... uh, uh, contracts, like, contracts yeah, CFO or CEO or whatever he does. Yeah. I don't know if I'm dropping secrets, but it's probably like, I don't think their names are on it. It was kind of our, um, you know, the owner was Sergio. He was just someone who, who knew them, approached them. Um, so he had another company kind of through Amazon. He wanted to take a separate idea through ClickFunnels and then they brought me on. So it was a very small team. It was like five of us that did that. Yeah. But I kind of like got to yeah see all their tips and tricks just kind of being there. Yeah. James and I were in, wake up warrior at the same time okay way back in like 2013 or so somewhere in there so yeah i, I definitely know james you know we actually i think i need him in the back really hard once uh because we were doing like these fights and stuff like that sure. and, right. so, uh, <laughs> that's my claim to fame like right there james. yeah uh, he's, like a cool guy. he's a cool like, guy he's a good thinker yeah for sure yeah, he, he thinks a totally different way than I do, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's much more operations, systematic, you know, that kind yeah. of guy. Um, yeah. So, cool. Um, Jonathan, you were going to ask something earlier, and I cut you off. Mm. But you probably <laughs> forgot by now. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, let's see. Of- I'm uh, I'm thinking of a movie that I, so I watched this past week. Have you guys seen Unhinged? Yeah, Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. So yeah. I'm, I was trying to think, like, today, because – I'm like, Sean, I haven't seen a lot of movies lately just because there haven't been that many. But yeah. <clears throat> that was one that came out, I think, last year. Yeah. One of the few that came out during the uh, pandemic. And then uh, so I checked that out. But I mean, that thing hooked me. And I was trying to think, like, what was so like hypnotic about that movie? Because I was like I was just glued to the screen like the whole time. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what your thoughts are. And, and maybe that's not everyone's impression, but. To me, it's like it's a basic story of somebody that's, you know, it's like ro- it's like basically road rage on steroids where a guy yeah. just like just loses it. And so I'm thinking, you know, people can sometimes I think those are stories that people can relate to. Yeah. Uh, but if you write, you know, y- you don't have to come up with something way out of the ordinary to write a good story. Right. It could be yeah. about everyday life as long as you 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 can apply a story to everyday life people kind of tune yeah. into it because it's like you can relate to it right i mean so yeah. it was like you know what kept me on the edge of the seat was like everyday life but it was a little hypnotic in the fact that it was like well this guy is like crazy you know and yeah. i could actually like you could picture people being like this or people being in a situation like this but you know it had that thriller effect to it that um yeah. is just that- applied to regular life so i haven't seen it yet but i have to watch it um you got to yeah it's good so is that do you remember falling down yeah i was gonna say that's that's exactly it's the same plot (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's 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 similar but it's a little more it's a a little more thriller-esque than falling down i mean yeah you'd have to update it for current times and current viewers he's more of yeah he's more of a bad guy and the protagonist is more of a, a female heroine which is kind of yeah, the, the modern right. take on things today but yep. yeah, it's very much what it is and it's kind of a i mean to some degree there's elements of like like the story i'm writing right now is like a movie um like wind river <laughs> mm-hmm. but also kind of you can put like the patriot or josie wells or all these revenge movies right yeah so so unhinged is a guy that's kind of like that he just snaps and loses his mind he's not 
rebelling against someone murdering his wife. He's getting going through a divorce, I think, is like the main idea. I'm not to get right. more than away than that. But it's just like he's got something personal. But that's your personal element that you add. Mm -hmm. So when they paid, I forget who it was, but the guy who wrote Die Hard, the original Die Hard was about like an old man in a building in the book, something like that. And this guy was trying to figure out what it was. He was literally in an argument with his wife. He left, is driving down the road. He's not really focused and he can't quite think of where to take John McClane, how to write this character. He looks up and there is a refrigerator box in the middle of the road on its side. He's like, well, I'm about to die. He's going 65 miles an hour down, you know, somewhere in LA. Sure. And he just like loses, you know, so, but he goes right through the box and it's not a box. It's not a real refrigerator. It's just a box. So he's okay. Yeah. But as soon as that happens, he's like, Oh, this is a story about John McClain, a guy whose wife left to go take a job because he never said, I'm sorry, or whatever. Now, us guys probably don't see most of that, but that's sure. what's actually happening. That's the personal right. story. That's how you like pitch the movie is like, I've been through this. I get this character. Mm -hmm. So, so I talked to Ethan Hawke in this last interview. He plays John Brown. John Brown's a guy who kind of started the Civil War to a degree. And it's like the whole story is like, what makes a guy who's got four or five people in his family pick up a gun at age 55? And that's where kind of Ethan, the actor, comes in. Like, that's what the story is about. That's what the book's about. You're trying to find that, like, essence to the story. And that's kind of where everybody connects on. When people say, where's my motivation or what's this about or whatever, that's kind of how you're connecting to these things. But isn't that what a really good ad does as well? Sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, it taps yeah. into that. I mean, I think about some of the classics, you know, they laughed when I sat down to play the piano. Right. I mean, that's that kind of story, right? It's yeah. it's a guy who's probably been looked down on by his friends. He doesn't have anything special. Like if you were to really unpack that character and if you were going to turn that into a 60 second commercial or the opening yeah. scene of a movie. Right. And you were to give the actor some background. It's like, okay, this guy usually is the guy that gets laughed at at the country club or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Yeah. Now they're, they're all in from golf. They're in the yeah. country club, you know, ballroom and there's yeah. a piano. And, you know, and that's the guy, like, Russell Crowe in this movie. He's like, yeah. if you saw him in this movie, the guy's like 350 pounds. I mean, yeah, he, he, he doesn't look away, like, yeah. he doesn't look like gladiator, gladiator at all. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's I mean, actually Maximus now. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. is very Maximus. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think find, you gotta find that human element in your ads whether it's yeah. whether it's in print like copy or whether it's a video or whether it's you know a space ad or a, an image um i think all that if you can get that little bit i was i was listening to rich shefford on a live stream last night um and he was i asked a, a question i was like what do you think the next breakthrough format is you know because most great ads the big jump happens when format changes, right? So when we went from direct mail to Magalog, from, you know, Magalog to book a log, um, you know, from online sales letters to video sales letters, evergreen webinars, like all these were format changes that created huge differences yes. for the exact same or almost the exact same copy. So I was asked, I asked him, what do you think the next like breakthrough format is? And he said, live streams, um, he thinks. <laughs> like scripted live script streams, basically, you know, well-planned live streams. Mm -hmm. But the reason is he said, anything that you can camouflage as an ad will do well. Sure. Yeah. Because once people know it's an ad, they put up their buying defenses and all that, but people love to buy stuff. So if they're entertained, you know, you've got a good shot. Um, I, and I agree with that. And I think you could take uh, Jeremy Finlay. I don't know if you know him. He's doing this. Um, you should check him out if you don't know him, but he has a thing called sales mm -hmm. and he's basically doing cinematic sales videos. Yeah. It's what launched wake up warrior, not launched it, but what really took wake up warrior to the next level was Jeremy's an artist and he's, he's a musician and he, you know, he's a great videographer and he put all this stuff together. Um, and he created this, what he's calling the sales So it's like a documentary and a sales video combined. And they're just, they're, they're like riveting the way he does it. You know, it's got all the after effects and, you know, it's just like, but it's storyboarded out, you know, all the jump cuts. I mean, it feels just like a movie. And um, so it doesn't feel like a sales letter. It feels like a movie. Yeah. And I think. We're definitely going that way. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I'd say where we are now is like, if it sounds salesy, but it's an influencer I like, like if, if like Tim Ferriss could sell me most things because I trust yeah. that he's vetted whatever it is, you oh, know, sure. not just yeah. that he's good at all the other stuff. But yeah, I think the next part of that is like, is hiding in there. Because like, I like hearing, like Conan O'Brien has a podcast and just that he always reads it and it's so goofy. The same with like Bill Burr. They just kind of read through. It's goofy. They're like, this is sounds stupid, you know, or whatever it is. And this is their sponsor. You know, it's like that makes me listen to it. So yeah. I just got my first sponsor on my podcast and I'm like, I'm more introverted. So I'm trying to think of like, OK, I'm reading this and I have to put all this thought into it and figure out <laughs> the best way to do it. And is this a mid roll? Is this an intro? Is this whatever, you know? And just overthink it where it's like people want that authenticity, which is in the documentary format, I think, as well. Yeah, I think so. And I, I, mean, I think Tim Ferriss, one of the things that makes his ads work so well is he's he does have a little bit of detachment. Like he doesn't care if you buy or don't buy. Like he literally doesn't care. He's like, I like the product. You know, I use it. They're a sponsor. Yeah. Yeah, take it or leave it. So it's which is right. what all great salespeople do, right? Like, yeah. they want you to buy it because you know they stay advertisers longer. If you're if they're sponsors or you get commission or whatever, however you know whichever model you're using. Yeah, but the best salespeople are like they know enough people eventually will buy that they don't care if you buy. Yeah, yeah. right. It's like, Just the, like if you ever listen to Ron Burgundy's podcast, <laughs> he's like, I mean, he's hilarious when he does all of his sponsor ads, but they're really good. The fact that he's like, you know, he's in character when he does yeah. his yeah. show all the time. Talk so. about movies that, like that's Inception. That's like the Inception is one of my favorite movies. I think it's like a marketing movie that nobody knows about. But <laughs> I mean, Rod Burgundy's like Inception, right? It's like a fictional <laughs> character having a real life podcast. Yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy. Right. Like we live in a, yeah. live in this like surreal avatar <laughs> type world. It's crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Brock, sure. we're, we're about, we're actually a little past <laughs> our time, but, um, yep. where can people find out more about you, more about your, get a copy of your book, um, those kind of things. Yeah. I kind of put everything just for simplicity, just, uh, Brock Swinson.com. You can find links to the, you have a YouTube channel, um, have a, uh, the book, obviously ink by the barrel. There's all, everything's at the top, the, the creative principles podcast, <laughs> Creative Principles is also, I just started Instagram like a week ago. I'm a little late to the ball on that one. So everything's at brockswinson.com right now, just kind of for the simplicity of all, all of it. That's very Brock, cool. And Brock is yeah. B-R-O-C-K. Yep. yep. And Swinson, S-W-I-N-S-O-N. And we'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. Is your uh, podcast on iTunes? Can you, can you Or is it just YouTube? I, yeah. or? I, iTunes and SoundCloud, yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. I have to check that out. Well, it's been fun. It's been fun talking shop. Yeah. Definitely liked it. I appreciate it. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, a lesson too, just closing out, like we were talking about writing, you know, you think about Daniel, you mentioned Daniel Day Lewis earlier mm -hmm. and we talked about Nicholas Cage, like who's more memorable, right? Because Nicholas Cage, <laughs> he's probably got more failures out there from yeah. all the movies, all the bad movies that he's done. Whereas, you know, yeah. you know, Daniel Day Lewis, like you, he's like, does like a movie every 10 years, I think. But yeah. Nicholas Cage is more well known. You know, he's just got so yeah. much stuff out there. So, well, I mean, yeah, it's sure. prolific, yeah. right? I mean, exactly. if you, yeah. you put more stuff out into the world, yeah, you're going to have more results. I mean, good and bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just are. We're, yeah. We're talking about uh, Jerry Seinfeld's new show. He was interviewing Steve Harvey. And somebody said, Hey, Steve Harvey, do you think you're being oversaturated? He's doing all <laughs> these shows, whatever. He's like, Do you think Nike thinks they're being oversaturated? No, I want to be everywhere. And that's that's right. Point. Good yeah. point. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point to leave on. <laughs> hey, man, Brock, thanks for thanks yeah. again for uh, coming on the show. We enjoyed yeah, it. For sure. Good conversation. Uh, we look forward to getting this out. Hang tight. We're going to put you in the green room and uh, we'll come right back to you here shortly. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Yep. All right. Good stuff, man. As always, Sean, good takeaways. Yep. Out of beer, too. So we must crank a <laughs> That's right. That's always a sim. That's always symbolic. Yes. End of the show. All right, guys, you can find us on persuasionbythepint.com. You can find us on all of your podcast platforms. Tune in each week. If you like what you hear, leave us five stars, and uh, we'll be getting this link out. We'll be posting a link to um, this episode and then where you can find out more about Brock and his stuff and his podcast, which I'm going to be tuning into. So uh, should be good. Thanks yeah. again, everyone. Have a great week. See ya. See you next time. 
All right.